It seems like every institution these days is promising carbon neutrality by 2040. But their plan to get there is often vague and, worse yet, impossible to square with their own growth plans. However, Princeton University's latest housing development for their graduate students and doctoral candidates is proof that meeting your climate obligations doesn't have to be at odds with your organizational mission. Using Passive House, Princeton turned a monumental dream into a measurable, actionable reality. Reducing energy costs, improving comfort, and blazing a new path for how institutions approach sustainability in their buildings. In this episode of Massive Passive, we're going to meet the team behind the new complex and get to really understand what this strategy means for the stakeholders. Let's dive in. Princeton University is one of the most prestigious higher learning institutions in the world, hosting some of the brightest academics you'll find anywhere. They've also made ambitious climate pledges, shooting for complete carbon neutrality by 2040 across all of their operations. This challenge is only exacerbated by a need to provide affordable housing to the graduate and postgraduate cohort. This project is really a needed project for Princeton. They have a large population of graduate students and postdoc students who are all really looking for affordable housing. We have a huge typology of units from, from single units, uh, single bedrooms and studios, to two bedrooms, to three bedrooms, to four bedrooms, all geared at different price points, all geared for different combinations of students, all incredibly, I think, well laid out for these very serious scholars that are coming here for their advanced degrees. And in early conceptual design, we were looking at it strictly from a, a, like Bill mentioned, an affordable housing prospect for the students. And, but alongside that was Princeton's ideas of sustainability and their mission for their lowering their carbon footprint. So they asked us to do a feasibility study to look at Passive House, even though at the time we actually weren't actually designing a Passive House project. We decided to go Passive House here for a couple of reasons. Primarily, we're interested in the strategies that the Passive House process uh, encourages. We promote strategies that focus on architectural and programmatic efficiency initially, so that when we do transition to active and mechanical strategies, we're, we're doing so in a thoughtful way. One of the things that I think was critical to the success of this project was the ability to think about the project in the context of the larger campus. It was much more uh, viable than if we were to just look at Passive House for this particular project in isolation. In alignment with our sustainability action plan, we have to deploy strategies that will allow us to be carbon neutral in the very near future. And so that means no burning of fossil fuels to create a heating. And so because of that, we had to deploy strategies such as geothermal, geo exchange, heating and, and cooling systems. We looked at the buildings that are being developed on the Meadows campus as our first opportunity to reduce energy usage. And by doing that, we reduce peak demands on our campus plant. And by reducing peak demands on our campus plant, that allows us to drill less wells. The, the cost associated with drilling wells is one of the major drivers of the cost of a geo exchange campus plant. And so by promoting a very efficient facade and very efficient building systems within the buildings that are being deployed on the, the uh, Meadows campus, we're able to optimize the costs of the central utilities building associated with that campus. We had entertained early on in the design process designing to Passive House as opposed to certifying, uh, but we felt it was really important to keep the bar high by certifying the project uh, so that we could learn from what those techniques were and inform our projects moving forward. The, the community itself is 370 plus units. It's just over 600 beds and almost 330,000 square feet, uh, incorporating obviously the FIAS design principles. Meadows neighborhood is made up of a series of, of projects. Uh, the Meadows housing, which we're standing in the middle of, is, is really the essence of the, that gateway. It's <clears throat> home for over 600 students. These are graduate 
and postdoc students, families, and singles. This is really the entrance of the Meadows neighborhood. Campus is this way over the Washington Street Bridge. And this zone that you're seeing here is what we're calling the quad. And the quad is really that sort of major wayfinding element for students on bikes or, or walking to campus. When you talk about student life, you have to talk about community building. One of the issues with these advanced scholars is they really can struggle, not always, of sense of loneliness, a sense of how do I meet people, of how do I make friends. It's one of the things I've learned doing student life projects around the country is they really are trying to have a, have a life beyond their scholarly work. And so we spent a lot of time developing quality spaces like this outdoor courtyard. As we move off to what we call the community heart, which is adjacent to the community center and this retail cafe, you'll see just this energy of community of bringing students together. We all know that packages are part of life today and we all get things from Amazon every day. So we use that package room as a central hub of that community. It's right at the heart of the community center. So there's a place where students will you know, go a couple times a week to get their packages and meet people. If you want to come out of your apartment and have a chat with somebody, read a book, there's a whole seat niche inside those portals and that's really a wonderful way to again meet your neighbor and the palette of the building the colors was developed by going to those trees over there those elm trees over there and actually looking at the bark and we use the bark as inspiration for the color palette and then you can see elements of wood that are used as accents around windows and around the portals that wood was really again part of the natural palette of the natural materials of the adjacent forest what also was a factor of this is what's called the Delaware Raritan Canal, which is just here to the north of us. That canal is a state park. It was originally developed in 1830. It's an historic landmark. That canal has incredibly serious zoning and habitat restrictions on any site next to it. So, for example, you're seeing three stories here. Why do we do three stories? Is because we have a 40-foot height limit. So really important in the layout of this building buildings is we had to stay under that 40 feet. In essence, being such a big project and long, that meant we actually have an increased amount of envelope that we had to deal with, both a lot of roofs as well as a lot of walls. And we also, we wanted to break them up a little bit, so each building is actually broken up with these portals, again, creating even more envelopes, so it was a bit, a bit of a challenge. The main body of the cladding are a, a, a fiber cement panels that were essentially pre-finished. And then we have what is a wood that's thermally treated so that it actually will just weather naturally. We wanted to use a wood product, but we knew wood actually has issues in terms of you know, uh, high maintenance issues um, uh, and you know, durability that goes with that. So we found a product called Thermary, which is basically a, a thermally treated wood that essentially has a 20-year lifespan as is. It can naturally weather the way it sits. So basically, we don't have to go back and stain it or go back and paint it. It actually can stay here and, and, and by warranty will last 20 years. One, one thing we employed that the contractor actually brought to the table was to do a panelized framing system. We mentioned before that this is a wood frame building but they wanted to do to save time, and I'm, I'm guessing, I think it was two to three months worth of construction time to do all of the walls, exterior walls and interior walls as panelized framing. So the uh, exterior walls essentially are panelized with the layers of the wood framing that holds, that holds up the, uh, that's the bearing walls, that then has a uh, Huber uh, zip system panel on it, which the Huber zip system is actually a sandwich panel of the OSB uh, sheathing that's impregnated with WRB with two inches of rigid insulation on the back of it that's actually was also panelized on the, on the framing, on the exterior walls. So those things came to site all pre-assembled, uh, section by section, and lifted up with a little mobile crane. So this, these buildings went up very, very fast. We're in the central utility room for the Meadows Apartment campus. So what, what we did 
uh, to basically tie into the uh, central utility for the Meadows campus, we have a four pipe system coming into this room that goes to these heat exchangers that we then exchange the heat into a two pipe system that serves all three of the buildings. We also take that same heat exchange and water and send it to our plumbing room that then will provide the domestic hot water for all three buildings. So basically this collects the, the energy through, through water and distributes it underground to the other two buildings and then to the rest of this building. This produces the hydronic heat and or cooling water that goes to every apartment, every fan coil unit. Separately, we have rooftop ERVs that are bringing in fresh air directly down into the buildings to those fan coil units and exhaust air from those units back up to the ERVs. So it's, it's kind of two systems working together. Massive tip number one, seams are more important than they seem. A lot of what Passive House requires is not that the components themselves are high performance, but that the connections associated with them are high performance. And those connections rely heavily on the construction process to make sure, and the architectural detailing process to make sure that they are, the connections are detailed and installed in a way that they're airtight. And so we felt it was really important to, to monitor the construction and to understand how those details were installed and then test the systems after the details and the systems were installed to validate that they were performing the way they were intended to. The thing that I most learned on this project was really the integration of different building systems. And what I mean by that is the integration between the windows and the siding and how those different systems interact between um, building leakage, um, air leakage, which is really important in Passive House, how the windows react um, to the dissimilar materials between the, the siding and how air can and can't get through those different systems. We did extensive testing during the process of the intersection, not only between the windows, but between those walls. We learned a lot during the process of, of initial installation and integrated that initial learn throughout the process in buildings um, B and C. Building A we built first and led building B and then building C. The biggest early test had to do with the windows and how we were gonna solve the air in and around the windows, really particularly underneath of the windows where in reality, there wants to be an air gap for window for airflow and window uh, water seepage to get out, but it, it contradicts what we need for air infiltration. So we solved it by putting weeps in and understanding the process and limiting the amount of air infiltration underneath of the windows. So that was part of an early package of understanding and really getting to know um, how we're gonna achieve building pressures. Massive tip number two, don't mock the mock-up. In hindsight, definitely 2020, we would have done an early mock-up on a window system and in and around the window, and we would have learned a lot about that um, because we are fighting different um, um, ideas about how to get water out but keep air in. So if we had done that early mock-up, and I'm talking about a standalone mock-up, not as part of the building, but a standalone mock-up, I think we would have learned a lot of that during, even during the pre-construction process. During the pre-construction process, we did an extensive um, mock-up. We did this for visual parts and pieces to look at for not only the university, but integration on how we're going to um, make parts and pieces work together. This was more for visual parts and pieces that, rather than um, integration into passive house integration, but it, was, it, told, it told us a lot of the integration of under, and understanding how parts and pieces work together. It was, it was rather large. It was about 20 feet high from memory and about 20 feet wide. So it was definitely large enough to understand and um, understand the material selections and how they work together. Princeton's bet on passive has turned them into experts on not only higher education, but also hitting sustainability and climate goals. So you just heard voices from Princeton, from our contractor, from our design team, and from our developer about the importance of collaboration on producing Passive House. And that importance is really the obligation of how we're designing and building our buildings and operating our buildings as we look to the future. Our planet needs our help. The built industry is a major contributor to 
use of energy and how we create buildings that reduce that energy yet provide comfort is really critical and Passive House is a great vehicle to do that. And as we look to the future and look to our climate, into our planet, into what we can do as designers, builders, and developers of the built environment, how critical it is to make our buildings different than what they've been in the past, to make energy and energy reduction the focus of how we operate and design our buildings. At this point, you might be saying, well, this is great, but what if I want to do massive passive on an existing building? Well, not to worry, we got you covered. Check out our Casa Pasiva retrofit project in Brooklyn here.